Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, I got some good news and some bad news. Uh, the bad news is, is that I've already done this uh, lecture once, but the computer didn't want to save it, so we're going to do it again. So the the good news is that you're going to get like a, an even better run here listening to me talk about China than before. But, so here we go. We start with China during the classical period, and we answer some questions here. Um, first things first. Uh, what were the two main styles of government practiced by the, the Qin and Han dynasties? Explain why China needed at times both forms of government. All right, so here we go. The Qin, they were legalist. Um, they placed their emphasis on military and agriculture. That was the strength of society, all right? They were highly, highly centralized. Remember, legalism is that, that form of, of uh, government to where harsh laws, strict punishments, um, they didn't believe in education. Uh, they, they burned books. They buried uh, scholars alive. Um, it is pretty, pretty brutal period, all right? But it restored order to China. Because if you remember, when they took over, they were taking over from a period to where prior to it, you had nothing but fighting. Nothing but wars between princes and small little um, villages and that that, are, that were trying to gain power. And so the Qin were able to seize power, and then as they got bigger and stronger, they were able to just keep going and in, in, in running over the, the other smaller kingdoms. And so they were the first ones to unify China, all right? And the Qin is where they get the name China from, okay? Uh, the dynasty only lasted for 14 years due to the fact that it was just so brutal and so tough. So the people finally lashed back against the harsh treatment and um, and kicked them out. All right. Um, if we take a look at uh, some of the things in the 14 years, uh, Qin Shi Gandhi, the uh, Chinese emperor during this period, the 14 years. You know, this was one of the things that he had built. He had parts of the Great Wall built. He had other large building projects built that essentially he forced his own people into working for him. And, and again, that's where um, people started to um, push against him. So then uh, we get into the Han Dynasty which followed a, a Confucian style of government, uh, and they last for over 400 years. Uh, the Emperor Han Wudi was the main guy, did a brilliant, brilliant job. Um, he started the Imperial University that taught Confucian values um, and had academic rigor or like toughness. You know, it was, they demanded a lot out of the students and uh, over 30,000 uh, at one time would be at the university. These Confucian scholars uh, would then go on to, to help emperors run China efficiently and effectively for, like I said, over 400 years. Um, now, um, so explain why China needed these different philosophies of legalism and Confucianism at different times. And for the most part, um, when we take a look at this pattern of Chinese history, to where there's a period of chaos, where everybody's warring against each other, then somebody seizes power, then uh, you have a, another government that comes in afterwards and lasts much longer, and then it decays, and then you start it all over again. And normally, again, period of warring states, this is the legalist government that comes in, restores order, conquers, but they don't last very long because the people hate them, and then the Confucian government comes in and lasts a long, long time. And then you can see that this is the classical period, and this is the Qin dynasty and the Han dynasty. Um, like the next time period, there's going to be a period of warring states. Then it's going to be the Su dynasty that comes in, and then the Tang and Song are Confucian-style governments and dynasties that, that last. So that's kind of the, the ebb and flow of, of Chinese history. Question two, economic question, the production of silk, uh, or explain the silk roads and why it gained its birth in China. All right, 
So here we go. So we all know that silk comes from China, but technically silk comes from all over Europe and Asia. Maybe not like Western Europe, but you know, as you get into um, this part of the world called Eurasia, you know, parts of like Russia going across and in that. Um, but the thing about it is that nobody did it better than China. They they fed their their silkworms a very special diet of like mulberry leaves and the way they took apart the silk cocoons and all of that made Chinese silk better than anywhere else in the world. And they actually protected these secrets and, and they did their very, very best to keep that technology in China. Um, people would try to smuggle out um, people that knew how to do all these things and, and they would try to smuggle them or kidnap them to, to go to like Rome or Persia and that, but nobody was ever really able to, to do it as well as China. All right. And so everybody wanted this silk for a number of reasons. One, the idea of, you know, fancy, comfortable um, silk, you know, this is a, a Han uh, royal family kind of silk garment, all right? You can see, I mean, it's it's still around. It's Silk is very, very strong. Um, and as a result, uh, it was used not only for um, clothing for royalty in that, but it was also used as far as if you really needed a super strong rope. Silk was, was by far stronger than... Um, normal rope was. Um, soldiers wore silk under their armor because of its strength. So um, all of these places like Persia and Rome and places in uh, the Moirin and Gupta empires in India all valued silk and so everybody wanted it. And so the Han Dynasty took special care of the production of silk um, and fostered its trade westward towards those places. Um, and so all this Silk Road trade is going to start over here and it's going to go westward all the way into, into Europe, all right? So the Han were, were very, very supportive of, of this silk production because it brought them tons of money through taxes. Um, social question, uh, Flyopedia. Um, this is the Confucian idea that all of our relationships are ordered. Old to young, women to men, worker to boss, government official to those being governed, all had outlined ways of how you were supposed to be, um, how you're supposed to treat each other, all right? And this is the example of patriarchal ways in China during the classical period, is that not only did children have to obey their parents, but women had to serve their husbands, all right? And so that is the, another example of just patriarchy continuing throughout history so far since agriculture. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, I got some pictures here for you. Um, if we start up here, um, you can see, you know, here's a, a child bowing down to his parents, and um, which is kind of what all you guys do at home, I'm sure. But again, giving uh, respect to elders; these are all seen as as being things enforced through the Confucian ideals of philo piety, um, the taking care of and the veneration of, of elderly and ancestors, um, very, very important in, in Chinese culture. All right. Um, you know, a little girl here washing grandpa's feet and giving the back rub and all that kind of stuff. Um, all examples of flower piety. Uh, there was the one. 
Uh, you can see with these characters representing Filiopd, um, the elder with you know this long hair, uh, and then the children who don't have very much long hair, but then this kind of long hair representing the the older, um, and then there's the the Filiopd with the with the child being subservient or underneath there. So with that being said, all right. Stay awake. We're almost done. Environmental question. Explain the love-hate relationship between China and the Indo-European nomadic people to their north. All right. Last part, and then we're out of here, all right? Um, China, it, it's the weirdest thing because China and, and even like those people in Rome and in Persia depended on these nomadic people to take these goods across this vast steppe region. There was really no civilizations up here. Now, once you got into Persia, sure, you had the, all of the infrastructure of roads and postal service and police and military that made all of this secure and safe. Same thing in Europe with Rome. India was safe, China was safe, but this stretch of land here was super harsh harsh weather very dangerous and the only people that really knew their way around were these nomadic people that grazed their animals and kind of traveled across and so the china the chinese needed these nomadic people to carry their silk and the goods over this way west and the same thing goes for these guys they traded goods with them and they came this way and now those people, these nomadic people, also depended on these sedentary societies because that's where they got their metal from, their swords, um, supplies, pots and pans, because those places could could make, you know, those items, those goods for them that they really couldn't do. So they depended on each other, and it was it was a good relationship until. Um, you get to the, the bad part of, of the relationship um, that they would invade. They would attack and come in, take what they wanted at times, and then take back off. And so the Chinese and even Persia and in, in, in Rome and Europe dealt a lot with defending those borders from the attacks, and it took a tremendous amount of resources to do so. And uh, this is why we have the Great Wall of China, all right? Uh, you can see that these guys um, spent a ton of, of time, uh, labor, resources, just building up the wall to protect them from invaders from the north. That's all these walls were meant to do. And when you think about it, I mean, they had strong militaries and all the rest, but it still was just, it was cheaper and better to try doing this this way. It didn't always work, but um, they put a ton of money into thinking that this was the way to do it. And uh, here's a little uh, video on the Great Wall. Um, after this video... Grr. This is like awkward. He did choose total health care. And he smiles at the kid. Wasn't well, that cute? All right. So anyways, here we go. Two minute video. Not going to take long at all. You'll love it.
All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being a part of it. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. All right. Take care.